Good evening. Let me welcome you this evening to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. I'm Rick Bird, and um, it's my joy to bring uh, each Wednesday night a word from a message from God's Word uh, to you. And uh, so glad that you have tuned in tonight. We're going to be looking at Psalm 32. Uh, David talks here in this psalm about lifting the burden of guilt from our sins. So if you've got your Bible, let me encourage you to go ahead and pull them out and open them there to Psalm 32. Let me begin uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for this time that we can again look into your word. I thank you for uh, this passage in Psalms, uh, David uh, speaking of his own personal experience in dealing with the guilt of sin. And Lord, I know that there are many uh, within the sound of my voice tonight who are either dealing with guilt or have in the past. And uh, Lord, we know that Satan would love nothing more than for us to walk around feeling defeated and discouraged and depressed uh, from things that we've done in our past, things which we have asked for forgiveness, but yet we still seem to want to carry that burden of guilt with us. And I pray tonight the Holy Spirit would free us of that burden and that you would relieve your people from the shame and the guilt of past sins, knowing that when Jesus died for us on the cross, he died to take away all of our sins um, uh, from the uh, least to the greatest. Every sin we've ever committed has been nailed to the cross and we have been forgiven all because of your grace and your mercy. So we ask that you speak to our hearts, Lord, minister to us through your Holy Spirit, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 1982, ABC News, Evening News, reported an unusual work of modern art. There was a chair affixed to a shotgun, and it was to be viewed by sitting in the chair and looking directly into the barrel of the gun. The gun was loaded, and it was set on a timer. The timer was set to fire at an undetermined moment within the next 100 years. The amazing thing was that people waited in lines to be able to sit and stare into the shell's path, looking directly into the barrel of that gun. They all knew that that gun could go off at point-blank range at any moment while they were sitting there. But they were gambling that the fatal blast wouldn't happen during their minute of time sitting in the chair. Friend, we've all sat in that chair where, whether we realize it or not. Oh, maybe not literally with a gun aimed at us, but in a similar chair, we flirt with sin and we place ourselves in situations that could cause us to self-destruct. At the least, we are left with feelings of guilt and shame from which we cannot seem to find release. They become a heavy burden to carry with us everywhere. I remember reading some years ago where a psychologist in Great Britain told Billy Graham, the evangelist, <clears throat> he said 70% of the people in mental hospitals could be released if they could find forgiveness. You see, their problem was a bad conscience. They could gain no relief from the heavy burden of guilt under which they lived. Maybe you can identify. If so, if you're carrying a burden of guilt with you right now, then I'm glad that you've tuned in to this message, for I have good news for you tonight. 
King David himself suffered from a guilty conscience. David was haunted um, uh, by his conscience. Um, uh, David had committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. And then David later, trying to cover up that sin, sent her husband to the front lines, basically being responsible for his murder because he was killed in the line of duty because David had ordered him to the front lines. David became physically sick, emotionally distraught, the longer he refused to deal with his guilt. Then God sent a prophet named Nathan to accuse and condemn the king. Under the burden of guilt, David wrote Psalm 51 in which he promised that if God forgave him, David would use his own personal experience to teach transgressors the ways of God. So, David wrote Psalm 32. In this psalm, David gives instruction on the nature of sin. What happens if sin is concealed and what happens when it is confessed, when it is cleansed, and when it is conquered? Here's what I want you to take from the message tonight from Psalm 32 as we look at lifting the burden of guilt. God, in his mercy, wants to free us from the heavy load of guilt that weighs us down. Here in this psalm, <clears throat> we have a lesson on sin and God's forgiveness. David gives four truths that deal with the guilt that follows sin. The first truth has to do with the cleansing of sin. Now look what David says here in the first two verses. He said, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David is overjoyed in his expression of gratitude to God because he realizes how much God has done for him. Sin is such an offense against a holy God that I want you to notice that just in these two verses, the Holy Spirit uses four different terms for sin in these verses. The first term that we find is the word transgression. Now that word means to rebel. Sin is rebellion against God's lawful authority. Like when a child says no to a parent's command. That's what it means when you see the word transgression, to rebel against authority. The second term that the David uses is the actual word sin. That means to miss the mark, to fall short. That has to do with deviating from God's desired path. God lays out a path, but we choose to take another path. That's what it means to sin, to miss the mark, to take a wrong path. Then he uses the term iniquity. That means bent or crooked. You, human nature is warped. It's twisted instead of being straight. And then he uses the word deceit. That means deception. It stands for the insincerity, the hypocrisy of human nature. So by using these four words, <clears throat> David traces the downward spiral of his sin. Now think about it. In his sinful actions, David had transgressed the law of God. He had rebelled against God's authority by breaking God's commands. Secondly, he specifically disobeyed two commands, adultery and murder. 
Thirdly, he expressed the bent of his heart. Instead of living the way he should and doing the right thing, David went with the bent part of his nature. And then finally, David was deceptive. He tried to hide his sin. He pretended that nothing was wrong and he acted deceitfully. No wonder now in Psalm 32, David shouts for joy. David realizes that his sin, his rebellion, his transgressions, his iniquity has been forgiven. David is free. That word forgiven means to be lifted off or to be removed from. David was free finally of the burden of sin, the burden of adultery and murder that weighed so heavily upon him. Friend, that's what happens to anyone who comes to Christ and confesses their sins. The Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 12, God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west and no longer remembers it against us. That word covered that David uses here is taken from the imagery of a celebration, a special celebration that was held once a year by the Israelites called the Day of Atonement. On that day, the high priest would dress in white garments. He would take the blood of a goat and carry it into the tabernacle and into the holy of holies. There, he would sprinkle the blood of that goat on the mercy seat, the lid of covering of the Ark of the Covenant. The blood was sprinkled there on the mercy seat because it came between the outstretched wings of the cherubim above the ark, symbolizing God's holy presence and the broken law of God that was contained in the ark of the covenant. So the blood covered the broken law, shielding the sinner from God's judgment. Friend, if you are tormented by your guilty past, I urge you to listen to this truth from God's word found in Proverbs 28, verse 13. Solomon says, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. God is willing to carry your sins away, to cover over your sins, to cancel your sins out. <clears throat> well might the sinner who has been cleansed sing, My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not the part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So the first truth about my sin that we find here in this psalm is that I need to be cleansed of it. A second truth has to do with the concealment of sin. Now, David, as we pointed out, had tried to hide his sin, and his guilt had sapped his strength physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, every way. David admits here what a fool he had been for trying to do that. Look what he says in verses 3 and 4. He said, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. <clears throat> David admits 
that when he kept silent regarding his sin, he suffered from what is known as psychosomatic illness, when physical pain results from mental or emotional conflicts. In this case, David's refusal to deal completely and honestly with his sin caused him to be sick or weak physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. David was miserable. The whole time he tried to hide his sin, he was miserable. At the time he committed the sin of adultery, he was probably about 50 years of age. But David began to feel and look like a sick old man, usually robust and ready for action, good-looking, strong, muscular. David had constant pain in his body. The hand of God was heavy upon him. David was dried up like a plant during a drought. Charles Spurgeon said, God does not permit his children to sin successfully. Think about that. God does not permit his children to sin successfully. Have you ever seen people who started out healthy, strong, good-looking, muscular, and because of some addiction, whether it was cigarettes or alcohol or drugs of some kind, over a period of years, you begin to see the effects upon their body and you begin to see them aging quicker than most people. It's the effect of that particular thing that has harmed their body, but not just physically, it has had an effect upon them in other ways as well. Friend, if you are hiding some sin, you are going to be haunted by the guilt of that sin. And listen to me carefully. That sin will have an adverse impact on your health, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. It is always that way when we have something on our conscience that we are trying to conceal. It will be evident in your physical appearance, in your health, in some way. Well, so the second truth about guilt is don't try to hide it. Don't try to conceal it. Instead, confess it to God, which leads to the third truth about guilt, the confession of sin. Now look what David says in verse 5. He said, I acknowledge my sin. So after David had um, uh, tried to hide his sin and uh, David had um, concealed it and it had affected him and David had been miserable. And David had gone through a time of suffering and anguish. David finally comes to the place where he says, I acknowledged my sin. In other words, David quit trying to cover up his sin. He kept he, he quit trying to hide his sin. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you, meaning to God, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, isn't that interesting? By confessing his sin, David was able to begin to put his past behind him and to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, as well as spiritually. Like a cool, cleansing shower on a hot, humid day, God's forgiveness washed over David and washed away the guilt and replaced it with a peace that passes all understanding. Friend, Jesus died 
that we might be released from the burden of guilt. All one must do is sincerely admit their sin. That is why we find this promise in God's word in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 where John says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, not some, not part, not most, all of our sins. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in John chapter 3 verse 17 following that very familiar verse for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says in verse 17 the, this. He says for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Friend, the trouble with some Christians is that they do not really believe the Bible. You say, my problem, Rick, is that my sin is so terrible that I've committed, I just cannot trust the fact, I cannot accept the fact that God could or would ever forgive me. Can I just tell you, that is not your problem. Your problem is not how big your sin is. The problem is you do not believe the word of God. The word of God says, if I confess my sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. That is a categorical statement made by God through the Holy Spirit and it covers all sin, past, present, and future. Big sins, small sins, middle-sized sins, it doesn't matter. It covers every sin you've ever committed, no matter what that sin may be. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't have anything better to tell you tonight than that. That the sovereign God of this world, the creator of your life and everything in this world, the thrice holy God, holy, 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 Isaiah described God when he had his vision of God in heaven. The holy God of this world, is saying, regardless of the sin that you have committed, based on the sacrifice of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary, and your faith and trust in him, I forgive you of all your sins. For in the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So, I would encourage you, take God at his word. Believe what the Bible says. Do not keep asking God for forgiveness for the same sin over and over and over. Believe him and take his word to heart. Like David, confess your sin to God and experience his cleansing and his peace. The fourth truth <clears throat> that I want you to see about guilt that we find here in Psalm 32 has to do with the conquering of sin. Now we've talked about the cleansing of sin, the concealment of sin, the confession of sin, but I think this one is the one where a lot of us struggle. How do I conquer this sin so that it no longer has control over me? Well, even when we've been forgiven, we still struggle with sin. Amen? <laughs> I know I do. 
Truth is, unless sin is conquered, a pardon is just a license to keep on sinning. So what do we do? We want to move on with our lives. We want to move past this weakness, this sin that besets us, that seems to follow us wherever we go. What can we do to conquer this sin? David says three things are needed to conquer sin. First of all, we must seek God's protection. Look what he says in verses 6 and 7. He said, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. For too long, some of you have lived with the notion that God is angry with you. That God delights in whipping and chastising his creatures. But I want you to look again at verse 7. Read it slowly. You, it's talking about God. You, God, are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts. That word shouts there literally means songs. You surround me with songs, David says, of deliverance. That's probably why David wrote so many psalms in Scripture because David had truly experienced the forgiveness of God and David was filled with joy. And David says here, you surround me with songs of deliverance. What comfort to those carrying the weight of some terrible sin who want to be forgiven. Ira Sankey was the music leader who teamed with Dwight L. Moody when he was carrying on his evangelistic uh, work um, <clears throat> here in America and in Great Britain. But Ira Sankey, before he became a music evangelist, had served in the Union Army during the Civil War. Sankey was on guard duty one night and he felt inspired to sing a hymn. Sankey did not know, but while he was singing that hymn, he was in the sights of a Confederate rifleman who, when he heard Sankey singing that hymn, lowered his rifle and did not shoot. If ever a man had been surrounded with songs of deliverance, it was Ira Sankey. Friend, David says we must seek God's protection. David said, you surround me with songs of deliverance. So, to overcome guilt, we must seek God's protection. Second, we must stay on God's path. Now, David, or now the speaker, is not David, but it's the Lord himself in verses 8, 9, and 10. So, let's look at it. Look what it says. This is the Lord speaking now. He said, I will instruct you, he's speaking to David, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Friend, how desperately we need guidance in our journey through this world. In verse 10, we see two paths uh, open to us. One is the path of the wicked, which brings many sorrows. Second path is the path of the trustful, which brings steadfast love. Take your choice, David says, which path you want to take. But if you're looking for peace and joy, you will only find them in fellowship with the Lord. So don't be a fool and take the wrong path. Isaiah warned in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. He said, we all like sheep 
have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But God is merciful. Though he hates it when we sin, he offers us for forgiveness. To show our sincerity of wanting God to forgive us, we must repent of our sin by maintaining an upright walk, by walking uh, a, a path of integrity, a path of purity, a path of righteousness. Solomon put it this way in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord, he said, with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Friend, God will completely forgive and restore us if we will completely confess our sins and seek to walk in his paths. When that happens, we will want to do what David did himself. The third thing we need to do to overcome the guilt in our lives, we must sing God's praises. Look at how this psalm concludes in verse 11. He said, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Why does David tell us, <clears throat> why does David tell us to rejoice? Because the Lord has declared you not guilty. Not guilty on the basis of your confession and his mercy. And the fact that the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has covered every single sin you have ever committed. Friend, we must sing God's praises. The one who has truly been forgiven and who understands what it cost the Son of God in order for us to experience the forgiveness of God will want to sing his praises from the depths of our hearts and to sing day and night and all through the day to sing of the goodness of God. Friend, the fact is we must never look at any sin in our past life in any way except that it causes us to praise God and to magnify his grace in Jesus Christ on the cross. If you look at your past and you're depressed by it, you must do what Paul did. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I, Paul says, I am the worst. And then he says this, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only true God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see that? When Paul looked at his past and sees his sin, he does not beat himself up. He does not continue to carry the burden of the guilt and the shame of that past sin. He glories in God's amazing grace. And that is what David says we should do as well. But I don't know what you're struggling with tonight. I don't know what sin is still bothering you, hanging over you, but I know this. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart as your Savior and Lord, you don't need to carry that burden anymore. Jesus has carried it for you. He carried it to the cross, and there he paid the punishment for it. And you are forever free of it because of the grace of
and the mercy of God. So I hope that you will take that to heart and you will believe God's word. And from here on, you will live with the satisfaction of knowing that all your sins have been forgiven by God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for this encouraging message from David, who did not do the right thing at first. He tried to cover up his sin, tried to hide it. But then David became miserable under the weight of his sin. And he did what all of us need to do. David was honest. David admitted his sin. And David came clean. David sought your forgiveness. And God, you forgave David. And David went on to live a good and righteous life. In fact, it is said of David that you said of him that we find of no one else in Scripture, he was a man after your own heart. God, I pray that all of us would seek for you with all of our hearts. Let the past be the past and do everything we can in the power of the Holy Spirit to live free of the guilt and the shame of past sins and to walk the path of righteousness going forward. For we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friend. Thank you for listening in tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you on Sunday or hoping you'll tune in again next Wednesday night. God bless.